to be here today uh, to, to share what God has laid on my heart. Um, for those of you who may not know me, I'm the chaplain at Livingston Adventist Academy. Um, and, and since I'm up here, I always like to take a brief opportunity to let you know some of the exciting things happening at LAA. So we're wrapping up the year. Um, graduation is just around the corner. But there are some exciting events in between. I know the um, high school music tour is coming up next week. May 19, uh, our campus ministries are going to be doing a spiritual retreat on the coast. So I'm excited about that. Which, uh, if you'd like to get involved in that, by the way, um, we could always use some financial help. So, um, Other than that, yeah, just, just exciting as, as we wrap up the year. Um, as I as I begin today, um, I wanna I wanna share with you maybe a bit of a different introduction. How many of you here? I know it's not fo- football season right now. We're in the off season, but how many of you here enjoy football? I see a lot of hands. Uh, how many of you like the Seahawks? <laughs> um, so. Here's the, the quick analogy I want to lay out real quick. Around Super Bowl time, uh, there's just uh, electricity in the air, right? We're excited, especially if your team is playing. And, it, and, and if your team is winning, we all know how we can get into it. Uh, we get excited. Uh, we, we clap. We shout. When the ref makes the wrong call, we yell in anger. Here's, here's uh, the, the, the analogy. When we come to church, we're so quiet. Um, so today, I want to give you permission to get excited about God. <laughs> to get excited to be in the house of the Lord. How many of you are, are happy to be worshiping God today? Amen. And so, let's get excited about God today. And so as I share, don't be afraid to give me feedback. I really uh, don't appreciate it when worship is a spectator sport. So give me feedback. You know, if I say something that resonates within your soul, then give a loud amen or shout hallelujah. Um, Maybe if I say something that challenges your spiritual life, then you could say, help me, Holy Ghost. Because we all could use some help from the Holy Spirit. Or maybe I might say something that you disagree with. Then you could say, help him, Holy Ghost. Cause <laughs> I, <laughs> um, but let's, let's, uh, I, I give you permission today uh, to be excited about God and to be excited about worshiping him. Before I begin, I want to read... The scripture reading today, which is found in Luke chapter 15, verse 1 and 2. I'm going to give you a moment to turn there. Luke chapter 15, verses 1 and 2. Say amen if you're there. Have mercy if you need some time. I hear a couple of cries for mercy, so I'll give you some time. Amen? All right, let's read Luke chapter 15, the first two verses. And it says, actually, before I read, I'm going to invite you guys to stand as we read. Um, we don't always stand up when we read, but, uh, you know, two reasons that I think it's a good practice. One, we honor the reading of God's Word. Amen? And two, uh, it is to help maybe some of us who have, been, who have fallen into a slumber to wake up a little bit uh, before before the message. Luke chapter 15 says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the opportunity to worship you today. Uh, God, we are not worthy. We are broken people. I'm a broken person, and so I ask God that you would help this preacher to get out of the way so that you can be lifted up today. 
pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, I have... Uh, last summer, I graduated from Walla Walla University. And so this has been my first year in the workforce. And in my short time experience um, that I have been in ministry, I've come to this conclusion. And that is, I think that if Jesus were to come down from heaven and want to join our churches today, that we might not like that. Although we worship him and we sing all these songs all day, if he were to join our churches, I don't think we'd want him to. You see, because Jesus is far too radical, he's far too merciful, too grace-orientated, um, I have a feeling that if Jesus wanted to join maybe one of our board meetings, that we might silence his commentary because he would change the agenda. We would be uncomfortable with him sitting in on maybe some of our business meetings uh, when we're taking care of maybe church discipline. He would challenge our grumbling and call out the undercover politics that so often happen. We wouldn't want Jesus in the church. He would speak to people that maybe we're not willing to speak to. He would draw close to those that maybe we don't want to be associated with. He is just too grace-filled. I think, honestly, I think he would get on our nerves because that's just not how we, 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 we work. We wouldn't want him to be a part of the church. He would disturb the spiritual equilibrium that we like to set for ourselves. I think some of us may even cringe at some of the things that he might do based on how we see him act in the New Testament. And in case some of you don't believe me, I am in the text. Notice the nature of the accusation made against Jesus. He eats with sinners. He eats and fellowships with sinners. He receives them. Now, I'm going to talk about John the Baptist a little bit. If there was anybody alive during the time who knew that Jesus was the Messiah, it was John the Baptist. I mean, they were related, they were cousins. He prepared the way for Jesus to begin his ministry. But we learn that as after John the Baptist was thrown into prison, um, and he was going through a tough time, and I'm sure he heard word of these things that Jesus was doing, that maybe he was receiving sinners and eating with them, and so he sends his disciples and he says, Are you the Messiah or should we look for another? Even John the Baptist, his own cousin. Notice again the accusation. This man eats with sinners and receives them. Now, you already just missed your first shout cue. Already you should be praising God that this man receives sinners and eats with them. How many of you are glad today that this man receives sinners and eats with them? If it were not so, I don't think any of us would be here today because this man receives sinners and eats with them. Amen. There are those in the crowd the crowd that Jesus was uh, address, addressing was a, a multitude of different people. And I'm sure there were those in the crowd who came to receive a word from God that day. And I'm also sure that there were those in the crowd who came to criticize what he had to say. Understand that Jesus came for two reasons. He came not only to save us from our sins, absolutely he came to do that, but he came also to, to change the distorted picture of God that existed. Amen? So Jesus, being the masterful storyteller that he is, begins to weave together three stories in Luke chapter 15 to address these people that have accused him of receiving sinners and eating with them. Amen? The first story we're very familiar with. 
the parable of the lost sheep. If you're still in Luke 15, I'm going to start in reading in verse 3. It says, So he told them this parable. What man of you having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Remember who is telling the story. And remember that is, it is a parable. A parable often has a deeper meaning. And I imagine Jesus was saying here to the church perhaps that the shepherd's job is not to babysit the 99. Now, I have heard of some churches where, where the shepherd would, would, would decide, maybe my job is to disciple the 99 and he'd go after the one, but the 99 would begin to grumble. Um, and I, I know that, that the 99 paid for the carpet in the church. I know that the 99 came to the work be. But perhaps it's time, perhaps it's time, and you tell me, Pastor Randy, perhaps it's time that you leave the 99 and go out after the one. Because, as I understand it, it is the good shepherd that places the shepherd in the church to train the 99 so that they can go out after the one. Amen? But they didn't like that story. And so he tells him another one. The lost coin. Verse 8. Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and seek diligently until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So there's a woman. She has ten coins. And understand the culture. It could have been ten coins, uh, a headdress, a necklace um, with ten pieces of silver. Understand the culture that that headdress or those ten coins, whatever it was, was given to her by her fiancé. When the groom goes to prepare everything for the fiancé, when he comes back, he expects to find all ten if she loses even just one, it renders all ten of them useless. Perhaps, now again, remember who is telling the story that it is Jesus speaking to a, a multi, multitude of people. Perhaps Jesus was saying or signaling to the church that you can't measure your worship by, by your church being full of people who, who look like you, act like you, smell like you. The measurement of your worship is that you find every lost coin in your community because when the groom comes back, he wants to find everybody he has put in your circle of influence. Amen? But they didn't like that story. So he tells them another one. And this is perhaps the one we were most familiar with. The, the, the lost son, the prodigal son. Reading in verse 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, give me the share of, of, of the property that is coming to me. And so he divided his property between them. Now we understand that this is not a true story. It's a made-up story to tell the true story about who the father is. The story also gives us a glimpse into the son's heart who he was, his character. And I would, I, would, I would say that his relationship with his father was transactional. How many of you uh, married couples here know that a transactional type of relationship does not work in a marriage? Right? You only come to your spouse when you want something. How many of you ladies here would appreciate if your husband came and said, uh, Honey, um, I, I, 
I haven't seen you all day. We haven't talked, but can you just cook me dinner? That's all I want right now. Um, I'm sure that you would appreciate having some sort of connection that he would bring something to the relationship and not only come when he wants something. The son's relationship with the father was very transactional. In other words, maybe some of us here, our relationship with the father is transactional. We only come to the father when we want something, when we need something. We sometimes ask for God's favor, but we don't want God. Mercy. We say, God bless me, but don't get all up in my business. there's There's a gospel song, some of you may know it, some of you may not, entitled, When the Praises Go Up, the Blessings Come Down. Now, as much as I like the gospel song, I have some beef with the theology behind this song. And here's the beef that I have with it. It it portrays the idea that God's blessing is dependent on my praises. In other words, God only blesses me when I praise Him. But how many of you here today that know that God's blessings, His goodness is not contingent on your praises. His goodness is based on His character. If He stopped being good, He would stop being God. Amen. You guys didn't miss that shout cue. Thank you. He's always faithful. So the Father gives him what he wants. Jesus in the story implies that the Father knows the Son is going to waste his money. But he gives it to him anyways. Even though he knows what you and I are going to do, He gives us his blessing anyways. Even though God knows what you did last night, he woke you up this morning, amen? God knows what you did last week, and you're you're here today, amen? And his blessings are still pouring out on you. Think about it this way. If God knows everything, he knows that we might one day get up and curse him and the next bless him. But yet he gives it to us anyways because in the same way that 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 same mouth might might curse him on Monday, maybe on Tuesday after that, that person realizes how good God is, their life might be changed around and realize how good God has been to them and they might turn around and begin to bless God. Amen? It's almost as if God's grace finances our foolishness. Even though he knows that we are going to squander his blessings, he gives it to us anyways. So he leaves with everything the Father gives him. The Bible tells us that he goes into a far country. I wonder if any of you here today know what a far country is. And you know, some of you, you know the story, your mind is jumping ahead, you're probably thinking, well, he went to a far country, he wasted his money on, on women and, and alcohol, and all these things, and maybe you're thinking, well, I haven't done those things, I haven't been to that far country, but how many, I, I'm here to tell you today that some of you parked in your pews right here today, maybe so far in your faith that you're in your own far country. Help me, Holy Ghost. I know I've been to my own far country. And I know sometimes even now in my relationship with God, there are dry moments, there are dry seasons when it's tough. So he goes to a far country. The Bible tells us that he has squandered his wealth in wild living. I once heard a sermon by another preacher where he defined wild living. He was preaching on the same passage, and this is what his definition was. He says, Wild living is everything you would do if church people couldn't catch you. Let me say that again. Wild living is everything you would do if church people couldn't catch you. I think there's, uh, there's some truth to that. 
You think that at this point in the story that the father would leave him, that the father would, would um, somehow have, have stopped searching, pursuing his son. Growing up, I sometimes heard uh, church people say, uh, talk about the, this theology or this idea that if, if you do something or you go someplace that's bad, God's angels cannot go in with you. And therefore, you need to stay away from those things because if you go in there, you will lose God's protection. A- am I the only one? All right, I see a lot of, of, of heads agreeing with me so you can relate. Let me tell you how this theology is neither logical or theologically correct. Okay, let's start with the logical issue. How many of you know that the devil is a liar? Amen? Okay, how many of you know that if the devil could get you in a place where God's presence, his grace would leave you, that if he could get you in that position, he'd bring the whole roof on your head? How many of you know that the devil would do that? If he could get you in a place where God's grace, his presence could leave you. Okay, so the logical side of it didn't didn't quite get you. Let's look at the theological side. Theologically, this doesn't make sense because as I read in the Bible, I read that the psalmist says, If I make my bed in heaven, you are there. And if I make my bed in what? In hell, you are also there. So that tells me that there is no place that you can go where, where the grace of God cannot keep you. Amen? There is no place that you can go where the grace of God cannot keep you. It, it doesn't mean that, you know, what we may be doing um, pleases God. But His grace has never left you and it never will. Amen? There's no place that we can go where the grace of God cannot keep us. How, do I have maybe a, a few witnesses in the house today who know that the reason that you got out of that bar in the first place was because God came and got you out. Amen? Do I have a few witnesses who, who, who can testify today that the reason that you're here today is because God came and got you out? The reason that maybe today you're living a different lifestyle than you used to is because God came and got you out. There is no place we can go where the grace of God cannot keep us. He's in a far country. And he finds himself in a pig pen. He finds himself in the mud. Okay, so he's he's left, he squandered his money, he's now poor, and he's he's in a he's in a far country. Let's uh, let's jump down to to that verse here. Let's, uh, let's jump to verse 16 here. And he was longing... Actually, let's jump back to verse 15. It says, So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into his fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. Okay, so this is the place that he comes to. And in verse 17 it says, But when he came to himself, he said... How many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread, but I perish here with hunger? So he comes to his senses in the mud. Okay, come come hang out with me here a little bit in the pig pen. It is often in the mud that we find ourselves. When we are at our lowest points with no place else to turn, we find ourselves and we realize how much better things were when I was walking with God. Amen? Amen. Remember that, remember who is telling the story. It is Jesus. And it, it, to me, it's almost as if Jesus is, is telling him when he comes to his senses, and I believe that God was speaking and would be speaking into his, his heart in this story. When he comes to his senses, it's like Jesus is telling him, listen, I made you from the mud. I can save you from the mud. Amen? Can somebody say hallelujah that Jesus can save us from our mud? Amen? So he comes to his senses. 
And he comes to this conclusion that even my father's servants were better off than I am. And so he begins, he decides that he's going back. And, and he, he begins it by, by rehearsing this line, by putting this plan together. He decides, I'm going to go home and I'm going to tell my father, listen, I'm not even worthy to be called your son anymore. Just accept me as one of your servants. Just put me there. I don't even care. But they're better off than I am. And so I'd rather be there than where I am right now. And so he begins uh, to rehearse that line. Now he's going, he, he has the, the right, he's moving in the right direction, but he has the wrong mentality. And I can imagine to myself that as he's, he's there in the mud, he's rehearsing this line, um, I'm no longer worthy to be called a son, but make me as your servants. How many of you have been in a low place like that, where you rehearse that line, God, I'm not worthy to be called your daughter. I'm not worthy to be called your son. He has the wrong, he's moving in the right direction, but the, with the wrong mentality. Because the truth of the matter is that when he left his house, when he left his father, he was a son. When he took his inheritance, he was a son. When he wasted his money, he was a son. When, when he wasted his money on women and alcohol, he was still a son. And when he found himself in the mud, he was still a son. Can somebody say amen to that, please? That if you're in that place today that you find yourself in the mud and with no place to turn to, realize that you're still a daughter, you're still a son of the living God. Amen? The grace, is, the grace of God is so powerful that when we break the covenant, God still keeps it. God still keeps it. The problem with our church today is that we have a whole lot of slaves where we should have a whole lot of sons and daughters. He's going in the right direction, but with the wrong mentality. And I, I, I imagine as he's on his way home, Walking, he's probably still rehearsing this line. I'm no worthy to be called a son. Make me as a hired servant. I'm no worthy to be called your son. Make me as a hired servant. Just make me a slave. He's rehearsing a works oriented salvation. But the goodness and compassion of the Father is that He will meet you on the way home. Even if you have the wrong mentality, just start moving in the right direction. Just start moving towards God. He will meet you on the way home. Amen? I imagine as he's, he's arriving, the father probably, he, he, he probably begins to rehearse this line to his father. He probably has it so well memorized by this point. He, he looks into his father's eye and begins to say, I'm no worthy to be called your... And the father probably interrupts him right there. He hugs him. He kisses him. Throws a robe on him. I mean, they throw a party. I mean, it's, it's an extravagant event. And it, you realize that in the culture, if you had taken your father's inheritance before he died and had done what he did... You should be stoned. But the father has a completely different mentality. Instead, he throws a party. And so I, I, I'm here to tell you today, even if you have been rehearsing this line, start moving in the right direction. God will meet you. God will meet you where you're at. Remember who is telling the story. It's not a true story. It's a made-up story to tell the true story about who the Father is. I mean, that's our God. That's our Father. That's the God that we come here to praise. Thank you for the hallelujah who ever said that. We should get so much more excited about the gospel than we are. Yesterday, one of my friends... Uh, sent me this text message, and I, I, I asked her for permission to read it. I was, I was sitting at my desk, 
um, after school just doing a few things and I get this, this text and this is what it said. It's a paraphrase from Psalm 103, 11 and 12. It says, As high as the universe is above the earth, so great is my love for you. As far as the east is from the west, so far gone is the person you used to be before I met you. Isn't that powerful? As far as the east is from the west, so far gone is the person you used to be before God met you. You ought to be praising the Lord for that. How many of you here um, enjoy the, the sport, the activity of rock climbing? Okay. I see some few hands. Uh, there, there is, there is however, however, one bald man in the back that did not raise his hand. And I'm wondering why he didn't raise his hand. But I have a few things to show you this morning. Um, a couple years ago when I was uh, a freshman at Wallowing University, one of my good friends, Pastor Randy, introduced me to the sport of rock climbing. At first, you know, I got to admit it was a bit nerve-wracking to be up on, a, on the face of a rock looking down and all that was holding me up was this rope and, and the diligence of my belayer. And you hope that they're paying attention uh, so that if you fall, they, they would catch you. So I began to get into it after a few, a few excursions and um, outings. I began to, to get more comfortable with, with the idea of rock climbing um, and, and literally pulling, putting my life on the line. Um, a very important... A very important um, tool in rock climbing is your rope. Okay, you want to make sure you have a good rope. Now, it used to be that as I got into it, I would have to depend on Randy to go because I didn't have any of this equipment. Okay, I got some of the basics. I, I got a harness and some rock climbing shoes, but I did not have a rope, a rope which is key um, in, in rock climbing. Okay? And so I had to depend on Randy to use his equipment. And so if I wanted to say go somewhere, you know, with somebody else, I would have to ask to borrow it. And if he was using it, well, sucks to be me because I don't have my own equipment. Okay, it, th this is how it has been for the last several years of my rock climbing experience. Okay? However, this week... I made the financial plunge and got my own rope. Okay, can I get an amen? <laughs> can I get a hallelujah? I got my own rope, okay? I used to have to depend on Randy to... <laughs> I used to have to depend on Randy in order to, to, to have a connection to the rock. But since I got my own rope, I no longer need Randy. I have my own direct connection, my own link to the rock. Can I get an amen? I no longer need Randy because I now have my own, my, my own, my direct link to the rock. Now follow me here because I'm going somewhere. Some of us here, Christians, we have not experienced this grace. You know, the title of the sermon today was Scandalous Grace. We have not experienced the, the relentless grace of God because we think that coming to church once a week is enough to have a relationship with Jesus, right? A lot of us in the Adventist church, we have become Seventh-day Adventists instead of Seven-day Adventists. We think that once a week is good enough or, or that a little prayer here and there is okay. Um, and some of us even use our spiritual friends as a crutch. To, the, they're, they're the only link we have to God. But I'm here to tell you today, friends, that you need to get your own rope. Amen? You need to go and get your own rope. It's not enough that you come to church once a week or, or that you, you say a few prayers here and there. You need to be connected to the rock. You need to have your own direct link to the rock. Amen? If we're going to experience this grace we have talked about, we, we actually got to spend time 
with the source of that grace. Amen. And so, as, as we're about to have prayer together today, remember, if, if, if nothing else in the sermon, remember the rope. Get your own rope. And, and I leave you with that challenge as you move from here. I, I think we should always be challenged to, be, to continue to grow, never to become complacent in our relationship with God. And so I leave you with, with, that, with that challenge that wherever you're at today, start moving in the direction. God will meet you there. Get your own rope. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, um, thank you for this grace that is so relentless. I don't even fully understand it. And I don't even think I've fu- even fully let myself experience it because it's just too good to be true sometimes. As, as we look at our lives and the mistakes we made, the decisions we make, there are a lot of things that we are not proud of because we are broken people. But thank you that you made the decision to fellowship and to eat with sinners. Because of that, today we sit here and we can worship you. Right now, as, as I believe your spirit has been moving in this sanctuary, this room, I ask that if there is somebody here who has not let themselves experience this grace, maybe who hasn't gotten their own rope, that they would raise their hand indicating to God that they want to do that today. That they want God, they, they want to fully experience God how God uh, wants to be experienced, how in, in the relationship he wants to have with us. Thank you so much for loving us, for a grace that is so relentless. Thank you for being present here. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.